Hello and welcome tonight. More trouble for public universities in the country as non-teaching staff unions resolve to commence industrial action on February the 5th as the payment system and sharing formula of earned allowances. ICPC arraigns former chairman of the Special Presidential Investigation Panel for the Recovery of Public Property, Mr. Okoye Obonaobla, and two others for alleged fraud. Nigerians stranded in Saudi Arabia seek evacuation back home. Federal government says plans are in place to return the citizens on January the 28th and 29th. An impeachment trial of former U.S. President Donald Trump over his alleged role in the Capitol riot set to begin next week in the Senate. Plus, we'll have business, sports and later on international news from our London studios. The already fragile public university system may be heading for another disruption as the non-teaching staff of universities today declared their intention to embark on an indefinite strike from February the 5th, 2021. The union leaders, after a meeting in Abuja today, accused the federal government on reneging on their October 2020 agreement where the parties agreed to resolve the issues at stake. The striking non-teaching staff are demanding that their members be taken off the government's integrated personnel payroll information system, as well as review the sharing formula for allowances between the teaching and non-teaching staff. The October 2020 Memorandum of Understanding, MOU, resolved that the complaints of Nasu and Sanu with respect to IPs would be corrected within two weeks. But three months after, there has been no correction of these anomalies, leading to a high level of restiveness among our members who have been shortchanged on account of the problems caused by IPs. Of the Joint Action Committee of NASU and SANU hereby resolves as follows. One, that members of NASU and SANU shall embark on an indefinite, comprehensive, and total strike which affair from midnight of Friday, 8 February 2021. 5th February 2021. Two, that two weeks' notice effective, effective from today, Friday, 22nd January 2021, is hereby given to government and relevant stakeholders of this development. Ahead of the expiration of the 21-day ultimatum given to the federal government, workers from the National Identity Management Commission are to meet with the Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, Mr. Isa Pantami, on Tuesday, January the 26th. The workers had downed twos on January the 7th to protest lack of protective safety equipment as well as poor remuneration and work conditions. Ahead of the meeting, our correspondent Linda Akigwe reports that FCT residents are still complaining about difficulties in registering for their national identity numbers. I'm going to attend to you. Hold on here. The clock is ticking to the February 9th deadline for Nigerians to register their national identity numbers and link it to their SIM cards. At a National Identity Management Enrollment Center in Zone 3 in the capital city Abuja, a group of people surround an official of the commission who reels out the names of persons to be allowed into the premises for registration. But those who do not hear their names called are angry. You know who come with the list, you say call name. You come with the list. I've been coming here for the past two weeks. You will come, they will ask you to go and they will give you an appointment. Now I'm here again. Still, I have not been registered. So it's not easy coming here. And I believe others are here too, lamenting that it's not easy coming to this place. We come from far places. This extension that government did, I don't know how, I don't think we can get over this thing in the, 
not in the next two, three months. So we may use this opportunity to appeal to them to do a longer, a longer extension to allow every Nigerian opportunity to get registered. The official explains why the process is tedious. It's not, that it's, not that it's not that it's difficult or tedious, but you know Nigeria, the way Nigerians do their things, you understand? First come, first serve. Like, if people still look on the list, I call them according to the name on the list, and I'll take them upstairs, you understand? Now, see, see, I've called these ones, but now moving them from this place, the ones there that's supposed to hold on, they will come and get crashed. By the time you sort all these things out, they'll be wasting their, their, their time too. The scenario at another registration centre in Zone 5, also in the FCT, is different as it appears to be more orderly. They are trying because he's, he's moving a bit. It's not, it's, it's, unlike, it's, it's not like other, other places. Other places, they are, not, they are not organized like this place. As the NIMC tries to register as much people as possible to meet the deadline, the union members from the commission who downed tools recently to protest poor welfare and lack of protective kits are expected to meet with the Minister of Communication, Mr. Isa Patani. They had given the federal government a 21-day ultimatum to meet their demands. The ultimatum is expected to expire on Friday, January 29, 2021. Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. The Independent Corrupt Practices Commission has arraigned a former lawyer of the EFCC, Mr. Okoy Obonobla, Aliyu Ibrahim and Daniel Omogule for alleged diversion of funds belonging to the panel. Mr. Wano Obla pleaded not guilty to the 10 counts brought against him and is accused of conspiring with the other defendants and also using his position to confer unfair advantage on Aliyu Ibrahim by diverting over 19 million naira received by the panel from the Nigerian Deposit Insurance Corporation for the purpose of furnishing its office to the personal account of Aliyu Ibrahim using proxy companies. Mr. Bonobla is also accused of dishonestly using a statement of results allegedly belonging to Olem Okoi Ofem to secure admission to study law during the 1985-86 academic session in the University of Jos. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has again refused the request by a brother of the late head of state, General Sani Abacha, Mr. Ali Abacha, to unfreeze the accounts traced to him and relatives of the late Abacha in the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Jersey, Liechtenstein, and Luxembourg. In a unanimous judgment delivered by a five-man panel of the court, the Apex Court held that Ali Abacha's case was statute barred as at when it commenced in April 2004 at the Federal High Court in Kaduna. In the lead judgment prepared by Justice Kudirat Hikiriakun, but read by Justice Ejembi Eko, the court held that having dismissed a similar appeal in the earlier judgment delivered in February 2020, it has no reason to depart from its reasoning in the case brought by Mr. Abba Mohammed Sani on behalf of the Abacha family. The appeal was against the July 19, 2010 unanimous judgment of the Court of Appeal Kaduna Division in which a three-man panel set aside the September 24, 2004 judgment by Justice Mohammed Lee Mann of the Federal High Court Kaduna earlier given in favor of Ali Abacha. And it's an unending drama in the case of the 2.8 billion naira fraud brought against the former governor of Ikiti State, Ayodele Fayoshe, as a star witness scheduled to testify for the EFCC is reported to have contracted coronavirus. Counter to the commission, Rotimi Jacob told the Lagos High Court today that he only became aware of the development yesterday and he's been monitoring the progress of the witness's health. Counsel to Mr. Fayoshe Ola Olanikwekun confirmed receipts of the additional proof of evidence filed earlier today for the witness who is available in court but requested for time to go through the documents and prepare for the witness. The trial judge, Justice Chuku Jeku Aneke, has adjourned the proceedings to January the 28th and 29th for continuation of trial. The former governor of Ikiti State, Ayo Fayoshe, and a firm, Spotless Investment Limited, were first arraigned before Justice Mujisola Olatoregun on October the 22nd, 2018, 
for alleged criminal breach of trust, theft, and money laundering. He was rearranged before Justice Aneke in 2019 after the case was withdrawn from Justice Olatoregon at the instance of the EFCC. The Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibajo, says plans are underway to expand the facilities of the National Reference Laboratory of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and challenges with the capacity of the lab are being addressed. Professor Shibajo stated this while on a tour of the facilities at the lab alongside the Ministers of Health and the Director General of the NCDC, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazo. We agree that we have a critical situation on our hands currently with the increasing number of cases being recorded. However, we have made a lot of progress since Nigeria's first case was recorded in February of 2020. We have activated nearly 120 laboratories nationwide, 70 of them public laboratories, and have significantly ramped up our testing capacity and case management. We have expanded the footprint of our sovereign public health response capabilities, especially at the sub-national level, and in areas where previously such capabilities simply did not exist. Not so long ago, test samples had to be flown out of the country for examination. This is no longer the case, as we now have capacity to process samples internally. According to Dr. Ihekwazu, the laboratory is one of the three in the country with equipment for sequencing and can test up to 5,000 samples per day. We continue to appeal to our leadership to find a way to provide sustainable funding for health security. Your Excellency, COVID-19 has taken so much from us, but it has also given us an opportunity to break from the past and build back better. Contributing to building the country of our dreams, starting right here in Gabon. At NCDC, we are committed to seeing this as an opportunity born out of the crisis. Our goal is to build a strong and resilient national public health institute for our country. Imo residents may soon have to deal with another lockdown if a threat by the state governor, Hope Uzodema, is anything to go by. The governor is threatening to order a second and complete lockdown in the state if residents continue to disregard safety protocols put in place by the state government to contain the spread of COVID-19. Addressing journalists at the government house in Owe, the state capital, the governor was unhappy about the attitude of residents to the virus. The penalty for not wearing face masks is a maximum jail term of six months or 20,000 naira in lieu. The executive order further provides that any gathering of more than 50 persons anywhere in the state is an offense. The convenience of such gatherings also risk six months in prison or 20,000 naira in lieu. I must make it absolutely clear that if our people choose instead to continue to deceive themselves that coronavirus does not exist and continue to go about without face masks and without observing the safety protocols, I will be forced to review the situation in coming weeks if it is clear from the realities on ground that extra or more stringent measures must be taken to keep our people safe, I will have no choice but to authorize a second lockdown of the state. In part two, after the break, more on COVID-19, plus Nigerians stranded in Saudi Arabia seek evacuation back home. Federal government says plans are in place to return the citizens on January the 28th and the 29th. That's all in a moment. Please join us again. Welcome back. 
If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channels Television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. More trouble for public universities in the country as non-teaching staff unions resolve to commence industrial action on February the 5th over payment system and sharing formula of earned allowances. ICPC arraigns former chairman of the Special Presidential Investigation Panel for the recovery of public property, Mr. Okoye Obonobla, and two others for alleged fraud. Nigerians stranded in Saudi Arabia seek evacuation back home. The government says plans are in place to return the citizens on January the 28th and 29th. An impeachment trial of former U.S. President Donald Trump over his alleged role in the Capitol riot set to begin next week in the Senate. The Aboyo State Government has again announced measures to contain the spread of COVID-19 in the state with a ban on nightclub activities and reduced hours of worship in church. The state governor, David Umahi, announced this after flagging off the COVID-19 compliance campaign in Abakiliki, the state capital. He also instructed the state anti-COVID-19 committee to extend its supervision to schools and ensure patients are treated free of charge across the 13 local government areas of the state. Effective from uh, tomorrow morning, we are banning uh, all drinking places and uh, cinema, you know, all drinking places, all dancing places, uh, 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 nightclubs, you know, and uh, we have to dust our COVID law and begin to implement it immediately. This is uh, the first step we are taking in terms of public engagement. We've already begged the religious bodies to limit the hours of uh, worshiping our God to two hours and to insist that I'm happy the Khan chairman is here. Uh, I hope the Muslim community is also here to insist that people wear their mask. The committee should also uh, go into the net and see how we can import equipment for oxygen production. It is possible, it is uh, doable. Beyond the COVID, we also use it in our subsequent uh, engagement. Some Nigerians stranded in Saudi Arabia for about seven months now are seeking evacuation back home. A viral video on social media shows the Nigerians packed in a room and lying on the floor under black cellophane-like coverings without regard for COVID-19 protocols. In the video, a voice is heard narrating their experience, pleading for pardon, and asking to be assisted to return home after their stay expired. Meanwhile, the chairman of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Mrs. Abike Dabri Erewa, has been reacting to the video, explaining the government's plan to evacuate them. On her Twitter handle, Mrs. Dabri Erewa says, Nigerian irregular migrants in Saudi Arabia are due to be evacuated on the 28th and 29th of January, pending any unforeseen issues. Their evacuation was delayed due to issues relating to COVID-19. We appeal to Nigerians to resist traveling abroad without proper documents. According to her, the evacuation is expected to be carried out in two batches of 400 and 200 by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, there are lots of questions seeking answers on these stranded Nigerians. How do they get into Saudi Arabia? Are they legal migrants? And who is responsible for their upkeep now that they are stranded? Joining me now is the Chairman, Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Abike Dabri Erewa. Thank you so much, Mrs. Dabri Erewa, for joining us on the News at 10. Uh, thank you for inviting me and good evening. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about these stranded Nigerians? How many are they and are you in touch with them? One, I'm not, I can't really, I can't confirm the video. So, um, I, I, but I know that we have 600 Nigerians that are illegal migrants that are to have left, uh, that will be leaving Saudi Arabia. Just today, we were with the Minister of State Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Zubiru Dada, 
the director counselor and other officials and plans have already been made to get them home like you said before the end of the year pending any unforeseen circumstances it's been on for a while saudi arabia said they want to rid their country of illegal immigrants and they give them deadlines and different countries have been taking away their citizens and nigeria will do the same thing but there's been delays dates have been changed basically you know because of covid 19 issues and there has been also argument that uh, who, who is responsible for the test Saudi says no nigeria says you should and all that but everything has been resolved and like I, 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 like the ministry of foreign affairs said today we should be home before the end of the year i know you said you can't confirm the, the video end of the, month, the end of january okay yeah. i hear you said you can't confirm the video but the 600 you're talking about that you are aware of what condition are they in at the moment well they are in the deportation camp awaiting to be uh, returned to nigeria and like i said they are from different nationalities different countries not only nigerians because saudi arabia actually packed the illegal immigrants and said they should all return to their countries once they don't have proper documentation of course the deportation camp is never the best place to be and uh, that is why the ministry of foreign affairs have been working hard to get them back home and like and i will keep saying we need to act really really discourage irregular migration it's 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 getting tougher more dangerous more difficult to survive as an irregular migrant anywhere in the world so one of the things we're really doing is massive awareness on the dangers of irregular migration now these 600 will come back and don't be surprised you see go to hear tears and cries of oh we we are irregular migrants we're stranded bring us back home so it really we really have to ensure that we put a stop to this issue of irregular migration it's dangerous it's deadly and um where you're running to ends up being worse than where you're running away from so that is actually the issue we have to deal with as a nation yeah the recurring nature of this sort of incident is worrying for many particularly looking at our, our image and that's nigeria's image now each time this happens um what sort of measures uh, proactive measures do you think uh, not just the the foreign missions or the embassies the government should be doing to to you know deter this kind of behavior yes you've said that um, it shouldn't happen but what is actually being put in place to stop it from happening it's actually something that every Nigerian should be involved in. It's not just government. But on the part of government, we should work, work at having a managed migration. Okay, these people are going to work. They just want to work. There's some form, and the people need their services. So why can't we work at having a properly documented, what they call managed migration? Some other countries are doing them. The Philippines does it. You want their, their staff, they come to you properly. And you know what they are being paid, and they even said they make as much as six billion dollars from that. So really, it can become irregular migration can become regular. That is all the right. point. And all the talks are going on with several, you know, countries. So it really can be made possible to be legal because they need these services. It doesn't have to be done in an irregular or illegal manner. I think that is one of the things that you must do, working with other countries. So basically, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Labour, need to come together to see the next steps to be taken in this regard, immigration and all regular agencies. So that should be the way forward for the government. But for all of us, we need to discourage our citizens from traveling irregularly. President Buhari instructed that a delegation should go to Libya. Under his leadership, Nigeria brought back about 7,000 irregular migrants. The International Organization for Migration played a big role in bringing back Nigerians regularly from Libya. But guess what? You see how stories of people still going there. So it should be massive awareness. Each one talk to the next person. Don't encourage this kind of uh, regular migration. I was surprised that even on social media today, some will say, oh, ah, we should still go. The country is so bad. Out there it is worse. And that is it. And government has some things in place that we can key into, the youth can key into. There are programs. It's going to go fetch you, uh, you know, big, big, big money like that, but you can survive with it. So really we need to encourage one another have a massive awareness program, talk to the younger Nigerians, the youth, that you know there are opportunities you can key into. It's tough, we know. Government needs to provide jobs and all that. That is the role of government, ongoing role of government. But we need to also encourage one another that really this is a dangerous, torturous journey and it's not worth it. If you survived a few years ago, not anymore in today's age and time. All right, Chairman Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Abike Dabri Eraba, thank you for joining us on the News at 10 tonight. Thank you. 
All right, when the news at 10 returns, Nasarawa State Governor Abdullahi Sule seeks assistance of the federal government with the activities of Boko Haram insurgents in the state. Please join us again. State Judicial Panel on Restitution for Victims of SARS-related Abuses and Other Matters began its sitting today with the case between the family of the late Kolade Johnson and the Federal Special Anti-Robbery Squad. The family witness, Dairo Omotayo Sunday, narrated how the late Kolade, in the company of his friends, went to watch a football match within their estate, but ended up being shot by an operative. Further hearing on the case has been adjourned to February the 13th, 2021. Another case heard is between Salami Adekunle Atoba and the FSARS. The witness, who is his mother, Fausad Salami, said that on March the 29th, 2013, two SARS officers from Lagos named Felix and Friday came to her home in Ibadan and took away her son, Salami Adeni Atoba Adekunle, and has not been seen till today. When I went to the office, first office at the Kedja. Okay. The boy was done for four good months. Oh, I'm dead. Oh, oh, shit, man. I was not allowed to see him for good four months. I was then told, if I want the matter to be charged to court, that their boss demanded for their boss, that was the shit inside. That was that answer. He said Lucky is their boss. Who is demanding a loan? Who is demanding four million? Cross over to Abuja now. Here's Terry Ikumi. Hi, Terry. Well, hello, Ijama. Welcome to the nation's capital. We turn our attention to security matters. The governor of Nasarawa State, Abdullahi Sule, is calling the president's attention to what he calls the havoc being perpetrated by Boko Haram insurgents in his state. The governor made the comments today when he met with the president at the state house in Abuja. After the meeting, he told State House correspondents that many of the insurgents belonging to Darussalam Group, who were actively operating within the state, have been killed through a joint security operation. But he appealed to the president for further intervention. I've come to see the leader of our party and the leader of the nation and our father, Mr. President, to brief him about some of the activities happening in the state. Uh, first, especially in the area of security, that we continue to have challenges with um, a team of uh, Boko Haram who were settled at the border with the FCT. And uh, we thank the security forces that they have been able to dislodge them. But now they have gone back and gathered at our border with Benue, and they are causing a lot of havoc. When they dislodged them, a lot of them were killed. Some of them ran away and leave their members of the family. We took hostage about 900 members of that family into life here, including children and their wives. You know, so during the interrogation, they confirmed themselves that they were indeed Boko Haram. And some of them say they were remnants of the Darul Salam uh, group that were dislodged from Niger. So they came and merged up and then became the Boko Haram. So that's where we got our confirmation that they were indeed Boko Haram from themselves. Therefore, it was an opportunity 
uh, Mr. President wanted to know, so I brief him, and uh, I strongly believe, just like decision was taken last time, to take care of this, another decision will be taken to do this. Meanwhile, the Zamfara state government is exploring the option of dialogue with bandits in order to find a lasting solution to the current challenges facing the state. But first, it is meeting with various groups in the state, including traditional rulers and security chiefs, on whether or not to implement that option. Governor Bello Matawale also expressed dismay over a viral story alleging that his administration procured vehicles for bandits to commit atrocities in the state. The view here then is to agree whether we should go ahead with the dialogue process or to cut off the dialogue with the bandit. So we are trying to achieve this today, no matter what time it will take us, we will take individual advice. And each and every one of any member here has any visible advice to say so. No matter what we are doing our best, some people are trying to undermine our capability. But as I said, and now it's enough. We are going to deal with anyone found guilty or found wanton with these activities. Therefore, the security shall be up to your standard and you shall bring any person involved in these activities. And as the war against insurgency continues in the Northeast, the military says troops of Operation Turatakai Bango have continued to obliterate the Boko Haram elements. The latest being the encounter between the 4th Special Task Force Brigade and the terrorists at Abagajiri and Dusula towns on January the 20th in Dambua local government area of Borno State. The Acting Director of Defense Media Operations, Brigadier General Bernard Onyuko, explains that the encounter resulted in a high casualty on the insurgents due to the troops' superior firepower. He says five Boko Haram terrorists were neutralized while few others are believed to have escaped with gunshot wounds with various fighting equipment and other items captured and destroyed. In Ondo State, the Nigerian army yesterday engaged in a gun battle with kidnappers along the Owe Foy Expressway. The soldiers who were on patrol along the highway reportedly ran into the kidnappers who barricaded the road while attempted to abduct some travelers. The public relations officer of 32 Artillery Brigade of the Nigerian Army, Owena Cantonment, confirmed the incident to Channel's television in a telephone conversation. He disclosed that when the hoodlums could no longer resist the soldiers' gunfire, they subsequently abandoned the victims and fled into a nearby forest with gunshot injuries. Some of the soldiers, too, were said to have sustained injuries and were taken to hospital for treatment. Away from security issues now, the recent approval of a range of new policies, including six to five years or as the new retirement age for teachers, appears not to be receiving praises by some private school proprietors. They believe the decision will worsen the unemployment situation in the education sector. Announcing the approval, the Minister of Education, Mr. Damu Adamu, said a bill would soon be forwarded to the National Assembly to give legal teeth to the incentives. This next report examines the issues trailing the decision by the government. Taking the bull by the horns, the federal government announced new policies for teachers in the country. I would like to indicate the type of date for the following policies. The retirement age, that one needed and got the present approval so it has already taken off on the 1st of January. 40 years of service, the same for it, it has taken off on the 1st of January. Special teacher salary scale, it will take off on the 1st of January next year. One of the new policies is the harmonized retirement age for teachers in Nigeria bill 
2021 expected to be forwarded to the National Assembly, which appears to be generating controversy. Describing the bill as a giant step in the ministry's reform efforts, the Minister of Education explains that the proposed law would also make the service period of teachers 40 years instead of 35. The Registrar of the Teachers Registration Council defends the new policy. Actually, Mr. President was guided by two major principles in his approval. One, we, have, we, we, we were thinking of how to attract best brains to teaching. That's number one uh, principle. Two, how do we retain uh, experienced teachers on the job? Because how to attract best brains to teaching? We discovered there are so many best brains. They don't want to come to teaching profession. A stakeholder, however, disagrees with the new policy Chairman, as he calls on the federal the government to reverse it. Due respect to the decision of FEC, I think it's a primitive decision, very archaic, and it does not support modern demands of our country. With answers, we should not even go that route at all. What we should be looking at, we should be looking at pegging retirement age for teachers at 55, 58 like it's done in the U.S. Some other teachers are also in agreement with the new policy. We are grateful to the federal government because after a long uh, lull, uh, it appears that government is becoming a little, uh, 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 is, is raising up to her responsibility in trying to attend to the welfare of teachers as it were. It is uh, a crave that we've been having for decades. And uh, we, we are beginning to see that the present government is very desirous to get education to where it ought to really be. The goal of the special packages, according to the federal government, is to attract the best brains to the teaching profession. But the school proprietor faults this argument. The law of diminishing return, which is a elementary economics, was setting. So I, it's funny and very troubling and uh, disturbing to see that FEC would sit down to say they are locating the age from uh, 60 to 65 for teachers and 35 to 40 retirement. Some other incentives captured in the new bill include hardship posting allowance, rural posting allowance, science teacher allowance and funding teaching practice from the TET fund in addition to enhanced entry points for teachers. And that's it from Abuja. Up next is Business News with Teniola Shobowali. Thanks a lot, Terry. Welcome to Business News. The commencement date for the new Czech standard is now expected to take off on April the 1st, and that's according to the Central Bank. In a statement released today, the CBN says the shift in the date from January the 1st to March the 31st is due to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the Nigeria Czech standard and the Nigeria Czech Printers Accreditation Scheme version 2.0 project. Meanwhile, the CBN says the old and new checks are allowed Allowed to coexist at a parallel run, uh, run until March the 31st, while only new checks will be allowed in the clearance system from the 1st of April 2021. In October last year, the bank approved the revised Nigeria Check Standards and Nigeria Check Printers Accreditation Scheme in efforts to improve the safety and efficiency of the clearance system. Meanwhile, the central bank says it will sanction international money transfer operators, which are still paying diaspora remittances to beneficiaries in Naira. In a statement released today, the CBN explained that its recent directive on the remittances was aimed at promoting transparency and significantly improve the inflow of foreign currency into the country. The financial markets regulator warns that strict penalties, including withdrawal of operating licenses, shall be imposed on any individual or institutions found to be aiding a betting or directly contravening these directives. Last month, the CBN directed IMTOs and commercial banks in the country to pay beneficiaries of diaspora remittances in foreign currencies in a bid to strengthen the foreign exchange market. 
The federal government's bond for January, which is worth 150 billion naira, had been oversubscribed by 82.28 billion naira. According to the Debt Management Office, the results of the auction, which was carried out on Wednesday this week, the total subscription received from investors for the bonds was 238.28 billion naira. This comprises 91.84 billion naira for 16.28 percent of FGN March 20. 2027 bonds, 106.37 billion naira for 12.5 percent of FGN March 2035 bonds, and 40.07 billion naira for 9.8 percent of July 2045 bonds. The auction result further shows that out of the 125, 99, and 77 total bids for the tenors, 73, 44, and 28 bids were successful. The Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zaina Hamed, has been speaking about recent ongoing plans by the federal government to sell public properties to fund the 2021 budget. Mrs. Ahmed, who was get our guest on our breakfast program today, Sunrise Daily, says that the privatization process is ongoing owing to government's plan to make them more effective. There are some government assets that are dead that can be sold to private sector to be reactivated and put to use for the benefit of Nigerians. So we are looking at different, uh, and I'm a member of the National Council of Privatization, we're looking at different categories of government assets that government has not been able to manage, that are lying down, uh, and uh, in some cases even completely run down, to see them off to the private sector. So the intention is not just funding the budget, is to reactivate these assets and hand it over uh, and, and have them bring contribution to the growth in the, in, in the economy. Well, let's check in on the stock market now. Friday's trading session at the NSC ended with an extension of negative sentiment from the previous session amid investors' concerns over rate adjustment at the upcoming meeting of the CBN Monetary Policy Committee next week. Well, Chimizay tells us more. Caution, that's the best way I could describe the market this week, not just for today. On the global scene, though, the markets are down owing to poor economic data and virus spread. But I must tell you, our local boss is not following the global trend. Investors here are looking for a catalyst to spur their appetite. And so, all eyes are on the Monetary Policy Committee meeting scheduled for next week, Monday and Tuesday. It's the first one for the year and one to look out for. And so, what we see today is a sea of red. Look at the insurance sector. It's been doing pretty well, and so it's not surprising that investors decided to take profit. But that's huge, I must say, almost 8% down. <laughs> That gave the bear the lever to raise its head against the bull, pushing the all share index down by 0.24%. The week to date close is also down 0.42%. And when you look at the activity done, it's quite a chunk over 591 million shares sold and worth about 5 billion naira. All thanks to Transcorp, as investors had a buy interest there because of the recent acquisition of 45% of OML 17 by Hayes Holdings, which is a major shareholder in Transcorp. Like I said earlier, next week's MPC meeting is one to watch. And believe me, it will determine the direction of the market. And for traders, if it's a do-nothing decision as anticipated, the bull may return to the market. But let's keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> And that's business news tonight. It's back to Ijeoma for the rest of the news at 10. Thanks a lot, Tanyola. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's impeachment trial over his road in the deadly Capitol riot is set to begin next week in the Senate. On Monday, the House of Representatives will deliver the impeachment charge to the Senate, triggering the trial process in the 100-member chamber. Here's Simon Pusey with more international news in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Chinese rescuers have said that it may take another 15 days to reach the miners who have been trapped in the Hushan gold mine in Shandong province since January the 10th.
The miners have been trapped hundreds of meters underground since an explosion closed the entrance to the tunnel. A total of 22 people are known to be in the mine. Rescuers have made contact with 11 of them, while one has died of head injuries. The remaining are still missing. Holes have been drilled and used to pass food, medicine and other supplies to the group while they wait more than 600 meters from the entrance. South Africa's government has said it will buy doses of Oxford AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine at a price two and a half times higher than most European countries. Senior health officials say doses would cost $5.25 each, where European countries have paid only $2.16 for the shots. Africa's worst virus hit country with more than 1.3 million cases and 38,800 deaths has ordered at least one and a half million shots of the vaccine from the Serum Institute of India. In November, the company said that its shots would be capped at $3 per dose. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been reportedly under pressure from some members of his cabinet to close Britain's borders completely. In the middle of a national pandemic. And Currently, people coming to the UK from abroad have to show proof of a negative COVID test up to 72 hours before their journey and must quarantine for 10 days. The government has also closed all the travel corridors until at least February the 15th. According to reports, some senior cabinet ministers have now been pushing to completely shut down borders in the same way Australia and New Zealand have. Google has threatened to shut down its search engine in Australia if the government proceeds with a new law that would force tech giants to pay media companies for the right to use their content. The law would force Google, Facebook and potentially other tech companies to share royalties with news publishers. Australia's world first code has been defended by Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who said that we don't respond to threats. Google has signalled that if the law will be enacted, its 19 million Australian users could face degraded search and YouTube experiences. The Japanese government has denied reports that the Tokyo Olympics will have to be cancelled because of the coronavirus pandemic. The Prime Minister, Yoshihide Suga, has expressed his determination to hold the Olympics and Paralympics and the country is focused on delivering the event. Olympic organisers hope that the vaccine rollout will help ensure the safe staging of the world's largest sporting spectacle. This Saturday will mark six months to go before the Olympics are set to kick off in July. And finally, a Scottish butcher has sent a traditional Scottish dish into the atmosphere for the country's Burns Night celebrations. Footage shows the haggis sheep's offal being carried by a weather balloon into a clear sky before reaching 107,000 feet before falling back down to earth. The food is traditionally served with lots of whiskey in honour of Scottish poet Robert Burns. The delicacy has reached about three times the altitude of normal commercial airline flights. The haggis has now been taken back to Howie's company headquarters in Perthshire to be preserved. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. And the main news again. Non-teaching staff unions in Nigeria's public universities today resolved to commence industrial action on February the 5th over disagreement on the payment system adopted by the federal government and the sharing formula of earned allowances for the unions and teaching staff. That's the news at 10 tonight. I'm Ijoma Onyato. Do have a great weekend, but please stay. Stay safe while you try to do that. Good night. Thank you.